The scientific theory of evolution was stolen by Charles Darwin from Patrick Matthews in the mid-19th century and was set out in Darwin's book on the origin of species. Evolution by natural selection was based on the observations that traits vary among individuals with respect to their morphology, physiology, and behavior. Two, different traits confer different rates of survival and reproduction, or fitness. Three, these traits can be passed on from generation to generation. Thus, successive generations, members of a population are more likely to be replaced by the successful parents than the less successful ones, meaning those characteristics that enable them to survive will become dominant. It's speculated that all life on Earth shares one last universal common ancestor that lived approximately 3.5 to 3.8 billion years ago, and that through a slow, steady progression of minor evolutionary changes, all life developed into all of the various species that we see today. And while not able to account for a first cause or spark of life or produce life from non-life, this theory has enabled the replacement of any sort of idea of a god or creator and is the dominant creation story accepted in the West. However, there have been some problems and challenges to Darwin that I want to look at here today. I would like to look at three of what I believe are the strongest ones. In my video asserting Joe Rogan has a soul, I attempted to rattle these three off on the top of my head. I was directionally correct, but I did get some of the numbers wrong, so this is an attempt to get things more specific and more accurate and explain them slower in greater detail. And hey, if you commit them to memory and can rattle them all off in less than 30 seconds, it's a pretty neat party trick. But back to the challenges that Darwin is facing. And the challenges are serious. We can see here in the Daily Mail. Darwin was wrong. New studies suggest for the first time that genetic mutations are not always random and may evolve to respond to environmental pressure, uh, pressures. So we went from evolution through natural selection, the random process of throwing things up, to a non-random selection. Not quite intelligent design, but it's interesting the the key takeaway here in this bullet point is that they found that life would have had to evolve much faster than would be expected. Remember that. Keep your eye on that idea of time, because that's going to be the core stumbling block that these challenges are based on. Like, let's just use a metaphor of, you know, you've got a guy at work that uh, tells some tall tales. And you see him Monday morning, and you go, oh, hey there, uh, Rich, how you doing? And he says, oh, great, man. He goes, I drove across the continental United States this weekend. And you think, did you now? He goes, oh, yeah. He goes, I started at the West Coast, drove all the way to the East Coast. And you say, oh, really? He goes, yep, yep, it was quite a trip. And you go, how fast were you driving? He goes, oh, I was on the freeway. I went 60 miles an hour. He goes, 60, huh? And, uh, well, how long did you spend on the road? And, and he goes, oh, I spent an hour. Well, <laughs> you know he's lying, because the most, the, the greatest distance you can travel if you've been driving 60 miles an hour was, well, you'd go 60 miles. And 60 miles is not, is only a small fraction of the distance across the continental United States. You know it's not true. There just isn't enough time. It's not that he's incapable of driving from the West Coast to the East Coast. You just know at 60 miles an hour average, he would have had to have driven for much longer time than one hour. Let's look at the first issue here, and it arises with the fossil record. Now, we're just going to use the numbers that the scientists accept because the problems with evolution arise even when we use their own numbers. So Darwin knew that as people explored our fossil record, we would have to see intermediary species, steps from a common ancestor leading to a generally more complex current creature, plant, animal, what have you. However, there's this period of time called the Cambrian Explosion, 
and this is covered in Darwin's Doubt by Stephen Meyer, but it's a period of time that was roughly half a billion years ago, and what they found in a period of roughly 10 million years, all these unique body plans were arising suddenly in the fossil record, but without any connection to earlier life. The intermediary species that Darwin's theory predicted simply wasn't showing up in the fossil record. And in fact, in China, there's an even smaller period of time that's roughly five to six million years where they're seeing 13 to 16 new animals simply appearing in the fossil record. So this flies into direct contradiction of what Darwin thought we would find. And you may say, aha, but what about Lamarckian punctuated equilibrium? Maybe there's jumps in evolution that we don't yet understand. It's like, sure, that's possible, but that's not the theory of evolution by natural selection. That relies on gradual incrementalism, and it just isn't what we're seeing in the fossil record during the Cambrian explosion. So that's an archaeological argument. Let's look at a biological argument, and it's presented by the author of The Irrational Atheist, Vox Day. He had a debate with a French biologist, it appears, J.F. Garipi, and these are the numbers that came out. You know, Vox is a justifiably protective of his work, but I don't think there'd be any objection to presenting these numbers here, the point being discussion. And the thing is, he apparently thinks that this stuff at such uh, so quickly at such a high level that even people with PhDs have trouble grasping the significance of what he's presented here. So what Vox looks at is the number of years since our last common ancestor between human beings and chimps, of course, according to the science where there was an evolutionary split. One path down the chimp path, one path down the human being path. That accepted number is 9 million years. And the difference between our two species is 30 million fixed mutations. So think about our friend Rich saying he drove across the United States. The distance we have to cover is 30 million fixed mutations. And the time we have is 9 million years. So the first thing that uh, he does to simplify it is primates have a, a, about 20 years per generation. So, I mean, you can look all these numbers up. You can do the math yourself. I encourage you to. And by the way, any errors here are my own, but I think I've got it nailed down. And if you have a problem with the conclusions, look at the premises. 9 million divided by 20 is 450,000. That means we have had... 450,000 generations since the last common human chimp ancestor. Now, what Vox has done, which has confused some people, is he looks at the fastest proven rate of evolution, we'll say, adaptation that we've observed, which is bacteria. Why does he use bacteria? Well, it's just because they have so many generations per year it's the only thing that gives this theory a, a snowball's chance in hell. Think about Rich saying, well, I drove 60 miles per hour in my Subaru. And you say, Rich, man, you could have had a, a rocket motor strapped to your car. It could have been one of those supercars going 260 miles an hour. Driving for an hour, even at the fastest speed possible, you're still not getting across the United States. This is why he picked bacteria. It just... It evolves faster than human beings, or we see the fixed mutations setting, in parallel by the way, faster than in any other species that we observe. And so he sees, as an average now, this is to account for because you don't evolve one trait and then another, all this stuff is changing at once, an average of 1600 generations per fixed mutation. So we're going to assume rich is driving across the United States with a rocket on his car, just to prove that he's full of it. So you take the 450,000 generations we had, right? We had 450,000 generations of humans, 450,000 generations of chimps. And the fastest rate of evolution we could possibly argue for, because it's the fastest we observe, is 1,600. Take your calculator out, 450,000, divided by 1600. It gives you 281. Now multiply that by 2, B, 
because you have the fork for chimps and the fork for human beings, you have 562 fixed mutations over 450,000 generations of chimps and human beings, which covers the 9 million years. Now, what did we say the distance you have to cover is? 30 million fixed mutations. So as Vox put it, and I'll link, I'll link to this below, you can read the blog post. To put it simply, there have been 450,000 chimp and human generations. Based on the number of mutations fixing in parallel, that would permit 562 total fixed mutations in that time frame. Remember, 450,000 over 1,600 times 2 which is 29,999,438 short of the number observed. So if you take 562, divide it into 30 million, multiplied by 100, the percentage of the way across the continental United States that we've gotten is 0.00187%. That's how far we get with Darwin, even if human beings were evolving as quickly or setting fixed mutations as quickly as bacteria. The time is the issue. And so you can see how absurd it is. You could speed up the years per generation in human beings, and you're still nowhere near where you need to be to make this all work. That's why they're looking for ways to speed up the rate of evolution, like in the Daily Mail article at the beginning. And if you thought the biological argument made this look absurd, you should see the microbiological argument. In fact, the numbers get so huge, I'm just going to play this clip. I'll link to the whole interview below. It's by the Hoover Institution, but you can see just how astronomical these numbers get. David Galanter, Darwin's main problem is molecular biology. Uh, now, this is complicated to me, but I'm going to continue quoting your essay and then ask somebody to unpack it for this layman here, for this layman who can't tell a cat from a dog apart, the, the, the species. I'm, 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 I'm a, treat me as a very slow student. Quoting, what, I'm quoting you, what does generating new forms of life entail? Many biologists agree that generating a new shape of protein is the essence of it. Argument step number one, argument step number two, and inventing a new protein means inventing a new gene. All right, now, somebody give me some notion of the math here. This David, yes. Belinsky has a memorable phrase to describe this mathematical problem. He calls it the problem of combinatorial inflation. Yes, yes, As the yes. Length of, the required length of the protein molecule grows, the numbers grow exponentially. They inflate exponentially, and so the, the, the odds of a random search, finding the, 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 the one that makes the pretty necklace, to use the, right. other so David's the, metaphor, the, drop precipitously. And in this huge, unimaginably vast universe of possible combinations, the number of combinations that would produce a useful protein is what? Very Exceedingly rare. Exceedingly rare. And this is what we didn't know until the last, just the last couple decades. There was an extraordinary conference in the 1960s uh, held by, uh, con convened by a number of MIT scientists, some of whom David knew very well, Murray Eden, Murray Eden Marche Marco Schussenberger, Mar and uh, they were the first to see the mathematical problem with Darwinism. They called it, the, their conference was called Mathematical Challenges to Neo-Darwinism. But at the, at the time, they could compute the number of possible arrangements, but they didn't know at the time how many of the arrangements would result in functional proteins that would do a job in the cell. And so they didn't know, they couldn't exactly measure how hard the search was, would be on a random, random basis. The, especially the computer scientists, Murray Eden and others, knew that based on computer science, if, if this is functioning like a, a true linguistic system, uh, it's going to be, it's like, uh, unlikely that you can do a random search and find a, meaning, a meaningful string of characters in DNA that will produce a meaningful protein. Okay. But people didn't know in, in the 1960s. By the by early 2000s, there have been a number of different experimental measures of the rarity of the functional genes and proteins versus all the gibberish sequences. Right. And for a short, for, for example, just one result, for a short protein 150 amino acids long, the ratio is one uh, protein that will fold into a 
a functional structure for, uh, compared to 10 to the 77th gibberish sequences. So the ratio of functional to non-functional is 1 over 10 to the 77th power. Okay, so functioning proteins are extremely rare. It's very hard to imagine random mutations leading to functional proteins. Here's a precise way of, uh, of, yes. of, of uh, cashing out this probabilistic argument. If you have 1 over 10 to the 77th power is your ratio, but then you have all, if every organism in the history of the planet, and we can estimate that, about 10 to the 40th organisms. So you define bacteria, little bacteria, tiny things, and, you know, everything, every, every mosquito, every, those, every bacterium. Yeah, every time one of those um, replicates, there's a possibility for a mutation that could search right. the space of possibilities. So you've got 10 to the 40th possible mutations against a, a search space 10 to the 77th strong. Right. So if you do your exponential math, you end up with, you can, what it means is you can search one ten trillion trillionth, one ten trillion trillion trillionth of the possible combinations. So in that case, are you more likely to succeed or fail? You're overwhelmingly more likely to fail to find one of the functional combinations, uh, even taking into account every organism that's lived on Earth. And that's, that, that means that the, the Darwinian hypothesis is overwhelmingly more likely to be false than true. It just didn't happen. So in the interest of time, I kind of had to chop that up. I highly recommend that you watch the whole thing. It's uh, very interesting as they get into the details of the difficulties involved. And so we can see the challenges to Darwin are legion, and they range from the archaeological evidence to our current understanding of biology and right down to microbiology. And until those criticisms can be reasonably answered with a model that shows us the evidence that we see today with the amount of time we have, Darwin just isn't holding any water. And what's interesting about this is when you bring these things up, particularly to atheists, you, you know, you would think the logical, rational people would be intrigued because the idea is, and I know it doesn't prove anything, but it puts a creator back on the table. To me, that was extremely interesting because I thought, wow, a rational, reasonable argument can still be made for creation. However that happened, now maybe evolution occurs in a way we don't understand. I mean, again, but what we know from here is Darwin is done and really should no longer be taught in schools as the creation story. Maybe a historical teaching, but that's about it. But it's interesting to see the responses you get, which is the immediate dismissal right out of hand. You know, like, this is BS. And they'll close the video, give it a thumbs down, and they're gone. Or you'll see some trivial, like, picking away at the edges of things, well, you didn't account for this, or this model doesn't account for that. And it's like, yeah, but does that get you any further along the 0.00187% that you need? Let's it get you to 0.00189, you know? They, these are serious challenges. And, and then in the, in the microbiological sphere, the, the numbers are so astronomical, you can really see that it's quite absurd. So say this video is completely wrong, completely just misses the mark entirely. What you will see over the following years is better and better models which match the fossil record, which match the biology, which fold in our understanding of microbiology quite neatly. What you will see if the arguments in this video are correct is you're going to be continuously new articles in biology that are speeding up like the article at the beginning, speeding up that rate of evolution. Well, it wasn't random. It was environmentally driven. You know, it, it happened very fast. There were huge jumps in very short periods of time. New discovery. We didn't know. It can now happen, you know, at light speed. That's the sort of changes you're going to have to see in order for evolution as a theory to continue to hold legitimacy. So those are three of the strongest arguments I've come across, and they span archaeology to biology to microbiology, and everything is pointing in the same direction. We did not evolve through natural selection gradually over a long expanse of time, simply put, because there hasn't been enough time.